Hello, I'm Matt Galloway, and this is The Current Podcast. Bees construct their defenses with a substance that no other animal produces, wax. The workers secrete it from glands on their abdomen and derive it from honey combined with fat. That's the mighty David Attenborough taking us inside a beehive. The bees are certainly busy, but are they sentient? A group of scholars says likely yes, and not just bees, fish, snakes, fruit flies, lobsters, and many other animals as well. Earlier this month, scientists and philosophers from around the world signed the New York Declaration on Animal Consciousness, arguing a far broader array of animals experience consciousness than we may realize. Kristen Andrews is a professor of philosophy at York University and the research chair in Animal Minds, one of the authors of this declaration, and she is with me in studio. Good morning. Good morning, Matt. What are we talking about here? This is a big question. Um, when we say that, that an animal exhibits consciousness, what exactly does that mean? Yeah, that's a really good question because this word consciousness could mean lots of different things to different people. So the kind of consciousness that we are focusing on in the declaration is sometimes called sentience. And it refers to the ability to feel something, to have an experience. So some sorts of experiences would be like visual experiences or auditory experiences, taste and smell. But some of our experiences are also evaluative like it feels good, or we feel pain, or we might feel hunger or satiated. And so we're talking about those sorts of feelings. We're not talking about the ability to um, have a dialogue in our head, or to plan tomorrow's dinner or anything like that, but just these really basic kinds of feelings. Because essentially they're aware. They're aware. That's right. What sort of animals are we talking about? We'll get into specifics, but but broadly, what sort of animals... And this isn't definite, right? This is like, That's there's right. a pretty good chance that this is possible. That's right. So we draw distinctions between different kinds of species. So when it comes to the mammals and the birds, there's been a lot of evidence over the past what, 25 plus years that they're, that they're conscious, that they have sensations, mm. and also that they have some kind of more sophisticated kinds of consciousness, like metacognitive reflection in the case of chimpanzees, for example. So that's old news. Um, we're focusing on the new news. The new news is that we also see consciousness in unexpected places, in vertebrates who haven't been studied that much, like the frogs and the lizards and the snakes. Mm -hmm. Um, and also in invertebrate animals, so octopuses, crabs, and bumblebees and fruit flies. Why now? I mean, you're one of the three scholars that has led to this declaration. Why this declaration now? Well, because in the last 15 years, we've just started developing new evidence when it comes to these invertebrate animals and reptiles and um, amphibians. And so... We think that it's important for us to um, communicate to the larger community that the science is happening and that there's a very um, large consensus in accepting that these animals, in fact, might be conscious. How, so do, you, we, how do you know that, though? I mean, I, I was sitting outside this weekend and there was bumblebees that were buzzing around. <laughs> I love bumblebees are great because they're, look, they're kind of looking at you maybe, but they're, they're not going to really hurt you unless you stomp on them or something. Um, but how would, how would you know that the bumblebee is sentient? How would you know that, the, how do you test for that? Yeah, it's a, an excellent question. So first of all, we have to remember that we, we, like certainty and knowledge and proof isn't what we're talking about in any of these cases when it comes to consciousness. Mm. There's an old philosophical problem called the problem of other minds that you may remember mm -hmm. from your philosophy mm -hmm. class. Um, and that question exists for humans as well as other animals. It's harder when it gets to bumblebees. This is the idea that we don't know. We don't know yeah. that what's, what's going on in other else. humans yeah. are conscious. We, we treat each other as conscious, but we don't directly experience it. We can't prove it the way we can prove like the two plus two equals four or something like that. So what we're, we're, we're looking at in the case of animals that we can't have like relationships with, like you and the bumblebee in your garden... <laughs> Um, we do experiments, right? We do experiments to test for consciousness in these sorts of animals. And so we focus on a certain kind of consciousness. Mm. Um, when I say we, I mean the scientific and philosophical community. I'm not doing these experiments myself. But in the case of the bumblebees, for example, there's been a lot of work done recently on their ability to feel plain, pain and to feel pleasure. Um, so the work done on bumblebee pain has 
caused bumblebees pain and seen to what extent they will do things like seek analgesics when they're being squeezed gently with sponges. Uh, if you go and seek a pain relief, then that suggests that you are actually feeling pain. Um, there's some really nice studies in the case of hermit crabs um, and their ability to experience pain. These experiments have uh, start with the crabs in their favorite kind of shell. So they have shells they really like. Mm -hmm. And then they're gently shocked in these shells. And they'll stay there for a while because they really like the shells. But if the shocks get more extreme, they'll leave their good shell. To try to avoid the shock. To avoid the shock and they'll take a worse shell. And I think that this is something like when humans are in a situation that's kind of annoying, like a really cold movie theater. And if the movie's really good, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tough it out. I don't really care. But if the movie's not that good, then I'll leave more quickly. And we see that too with the, the crabs in the shells. If they're in a worse quality shell and they're shocked, they're like, I'm out of here right away. I have a couple of questions about fish. Sure. One is about what some fish can recognize themselves. They can. They can. Explain that to me. Right. So if you put a mark on a cleaner ras fish and give the fish a mirror so they can see the mark on their body, they will rub the mark onto substrate in the tank, suggesting that they recognize that that mark is on their body. That they realize that the fish in the mirror is them. That's right. And this is a test that we do with children, with chimpanzees. Um, children are able to do it at about a year and a half. Chimpanzees are able to do this. You surreptitiously mark a chimp, they'll go into a mirror and they'll touch the mark on their head that they didn't know was marked. Kids will do that too. You can do that with your kids at home if you have mm -hmm. such a young child. Um, and the fish do it as well. Dolphins do it. It's been tested in a, in a number of different species. It's hard, to, it's hard to test this in some species because they don't really use mirrors yeah. and eyes aren't all that important. If you put a mirror in front of a fish, it may swim away. It, may it not might use swim away. Mirror. If you do this with your cat, the cat's not going to care at all. Mm. Um, I walk my dog past mirrors on the streets of Toronto and sometimes he looks surprised. He never acts like it's him. So in the case of dogs, um, a different sort of self-recognition task is used. And this is an olfactory self-recognition task. So the dog, dogs you might notice like to smell things. Mm -hmm. um, they smell urine a lot. Mm -hmm. And they also will smell their urine and other individuals' urines. So in a clever version of a mere self-recognition task with dogs, um, the dog's own urine was olf marked with a different scent. And the, the dogs would spend more time smelling their own urine when it was marked with this different kind of scent. Um, because, it would, because it was new. Because it was Because it was new and different. It was like a visual mark. It shouldn't be there. And so they uh, yeah, spent more time with that, that smell. Because the other question that I had about fish, and this is about what you said at the beginning, is that, that these animals can experience something. Yeah. That the fish know that something's happening if they're caught on a hook, right? Mm-hmm. So if I'm out fishing, mm -hmm. I think I'm pulling the fish up, but the fish understands that something's going on as well. Well, it's hard for us to know whether the fish understands something, right? It's hard for us to know what they're thinking. But, but they are thinking something. Well, they're feeling something. Yeah. So when we're talking about sentience, we're talking about feelings, and we're not talking about what they think. Mm -hmm. There are other sorts of experiments that comparative cognition researchers do to try to get at what animals think. But when we're talking about consciousness, we're really focused on feeling. And feeling and thinking can be intertwined, mm -hmm. right? Um, but we don't know to what extent they're intertwined in these other animals. But we think that the fish is feeling something at the we, very least if we it's do. on a hook. That's right. And we think that the fish is feeling something when they're caught on a hook. Because in the lab, when you put a, a vinegar solution in a bee's lip, the, the uh, sorry, in the fish's lip, the fish will then rub its lip uh, on the ground. The fish will swim into a tank where there's an analgesic in the water that will keep the, uh, you know, in, in humans, will modulate the pain. So in the last couple of minutes that we have, what are we supposed to do with this information? I mean, it's fascinating. It kind of melts your brain. But what are we supposed to do with this information? Well, I think that there are two really important implications of this uh, this area of research, right? The fact that we think that there's a realistic possibility of consciousness in insects and octopuses and crabs um, 
suggests to me that if we want to uncover the mysteries of consciousness, so this is something that we've been working on for decades, and we haven't made a lot of success yeah. on this question. It's what one, is it's the one nature? of those great mysteries. Yeah. It is. But we've been studying consciousness in humans and in monkeys. We haven't been studying consciousness in fish or fruit flies or bumblebees. And if we look at less elaborated models of consciousness, we might be able to make real progress on uncovering the mysteries of consciousness if we do science a little bit differently. We have labs across the world with fruit flies in them. And maybe uh, someone can do a side project on consciousness and fruit flies. Maybe that will be a way to answer this question about what is the nature of consciousness. The other question is, did you ever read... Um Consider the Lobster by David Foster Wallace. Mm -hmm. It's a long magazine piece about eating lobster mm -hmm. and about his understanding of what the lobster was going through when you put it in the pot. If we know that the fish is experiencing something when it's on the hook or that the lobster understands that it's being boiled in a pot, do we then stop eating? It, we know this intellectually already, right? That these animals probably feel some degree of pain, but we are able to, through cognitive dissonance, kind of park that. Right. If this becomes more prominent, what do we do with that information? Does it change what right. we eat? Yeah. So this is the second really important implication of this research, that we have to recognize that it's not just the cows and the pigs and the, and the um, chicken who feel pain, but the lobster, the crabs, uh, the octopus also probably feel pain, right? That there's a realistic possibility that they are feeling things. And when we put the lobster in the pot of boiling water, we are killing it in a way that's going to cause potentially intense pain. So what do we do with about that? Yeah. The same thing that we're doing right now when it comes to the pigs and the chickens. We have welfare protection over how the animals are raised, how they're housed, and also how they're killed. As a society, we can also have conversations about whether we want to continue housing and raising and killing and eating animals. Of course, that's, that's going to be an ongoing conversation in society. But right now, we already are doing that with sentient creatures. We're already raising them, killing them, and eating them. And so it's just more animals that we're realizing need to be covered by welfare protection policy right now. I have to let you go, but what's the big question that you still... I mean, th these are a lot of questions, but what's one big question that you still want answered when it comes to this? Well, I really want to know how the thinking and feeling relate. Mm. I am so curious about that. So if I can talk to a bumblebee about that, I would, uh, I'd be there in a second. When you talk to the bumblebee, you'll come back and tell us what the bumblebee said. Absolutely. Kristen, thank you. Thanks so much. Kristen Andrews is a philo philosophy professor at York University, also the research chair in animal minds at that school.